So this is um, kind of early work. And so I appreciate the ability to be able to sort of present this kind of work in progress. So basically what we have here is kind of like two-ish paper. So one's gonna be a paper that we published as an NBR working paper on sort of a semi-large pilot study where we're looking at gender identity, race, ethnicity discrimination and access to mental health care appointments. Uh, so we're using an audit field experiment approach for that. So I'll explain what that is. And then we had this quirk where we happened to have run that study unintentionally during COVID-19 because that was a exogenous event for us. And so we happened to have some interesting data that we can use to see how COVID-19 affects access to mental health care appointments. So we're, so um, Ben, who is also in the crowd, is my co-author of both these studies, and he's sort of leading the second paper. Um, and so I'm really excited to present to you sort of preliminary results from both. And then we'll also, both these studies, and then we'll also talk about like how we're collecting more data to do sort of additional papers. So some are going to be spin-off papers, some are just going to be more data collection on the first paper because we do have a small sample. So um, because this is sort of in the field now, like we're just about to do the next wave of data collection, any kind of comments or feedback you have is really helpful because uh, we can make those changes and actually put it into the experiment versus if we were to do the experiment, you said, I wish you had done the experiment this way. It's like, well, we can't go back and do that. So I really appreciate the ability to present work that's sort of not completely finished. And so this kind of a context is super helpful. So I really appreciate being here. Um, in terms of the presentation style, like the way that often audit field experiments are is like, there's a lot of bells and whistles to them. It's like, we do this and we do this. There's a lot of questions around like, what about this? What about this? Like, how do you do this? And so I'm going to do my best to, try to explain things, but there's likely going to be a lot of questions you have. And those are extremely helpful to help me clarify what's going on. And then also, you know, I, I'm in the weeds with these field experiments all the time. So I'm probably bad at explaining things. So any kind of questions you have are helpful. So I'm monitoring the chat, but you can also just jump in anytime and interrupt. That's super helpful with any kind of question you have, whether it's clarification or anything like that, that's super helpful. So I appreciate any kind of comments or questions or anything at any time is very helpful. Um, and if it's something I'm going to address later, I might sort of put a pin in that and then we'll come back to it later, but I'll make sure we, we, we talk about your question. All right. So the kind of general outline here is we're going to talk about the first paper first, which is sort of the setup that kind of leads to the second paper because it's the same data set. And so this is going to be a pilot study with 1,000 observations. We're looking at um, gender identity, race, ethnicity, discrimination, and access to mental health care using an audit field experiment. So I'll give you some of the motivation around um, discrimination against trans people um, and so sort of mental health disparities that trans people of color face. A little bit of background on that, nothing too much though, since I think we know kind of some of that basics. And then I'll get into the weeds on how we set up the experiment, what we're doing there. Um, and then give some descriptive statistics and then give you some of the results from the study. And then we'll kind of walk you through all the stuff that we would like to do, but we haven't done yet. So what's probably gonna happen in the presentation, which is super helpful is people are gonna be like, oh, this is really cool, but what about this? And I'll be like, that's amazing. Absolutely, I'm going to do that, but let me talk about that later because I have a plan for that. So, so many things that like we really want to do, but we haven't done yet. And any kind of ideas you have on what we can do next is super helpful because there might be things we missed. But sort of at the end of this presentation, I'm going to go through like here's all the stuff that we need to do and we should do, and we absolutely wish we had done, but we don't have we don't have done yet. So that's going to be sort of the end of the presentation, the first part. Um, and then the remaining time is going to be um, this very early results on this um, pen uh, paper that Ben is leading. Uh, Benjamin Harris leading on um, COVID-19, how it sort of moderates access to mental health care. Um, so we'll give a little brief introduction about sort of the context of COVID-19 and mental health care, but I don't think that's too, uh, needs too much focus because I think we kind of know some of the basics around that. And then we don't have to talk about the experimental design because we all already know it's the exact same experiment and we'll just go through some descriptive stats and some results and a little bit of next steps. And then throughout this, any kind of questions are helpful. And then Ben is going to be in the chat and he's also sort of being very helpful to me today uh, with the slides and making sure, you know, like I had some like fear I was going to like faint or something. I'm fine. I'm totally fine. But I was worried like what if I can't present and then he could jump in or something or, you know, more, more so like the, the COVID paper is more his thing. And so I'm probably going to get some question where I don't know the answer, then he can jump in and kind of save me because he actually knows more about that paper than I do. So that's why he's the lead author on that paper. Um, yeah, so appreciate him being here. So feel free to uh, jump in with questions either in chat or, or unmute yourself. Either way is awesome. I really appreciate it. And if I miss you, like maybe if you have your hand raised or they're virtually in person, I miss you. I apologize. Um, but I'm doing my best to sort of take a look at everyone. So make sure that you're, you're unable to answer your questions. All right.
Uh, yes, I can do that. So apologies, I do tend to speak too quickly, so I can do that. So thank you for that feedback. Okay, so let's um, give a little bit of background first. So we're talking about discrimination against trans people, non-binary people, what does that mean? So some of you know a lot of this terminology, but for some people it's new. So I wanted to kind of make sure we understood these definitions. And if you have any questions around this, let me know. I'm very happy to clarify to make sure that we understand what these terms mean and sort of how we're gonna use them in this paper. Um, so, so there's the term transgender is a term that is a broad umbrella term that basically means someone who has a gender expression or gender identity that differs from the one differs from the sex classification they were assigned at birth. So it could be someone who's assigned male at birth or female at birth that has a gender expression and it doesn't necessarily fit that. So it could be someone who's assigned female at birth that identifies as male or someone who's female at birth that just identifies as non-binary. So neither male nor female or a combination of that. So it's a very, very broad term. In the context of this paper, we're gonna be looking at people that are transgender women or transgender men. So transgender women will be people that were assigned, typically assigned male at birth and identify as women. Then transgender men would be people that were assigned female at birth that identify as men. Um, and within transgender, because transgender is sort of a broad umbrella term, non-binary typically falls within transgender, but we focus in addition on non-binary people separately. So we also want to talk about who non-binary people are. And so non-binary is also a big spectrum of individuals and uh, sort of people that are not exclusively male or female in terms of their identity or expression. Um, so some, falling somewhere um, in the middle is sort of people that are non-binary. And the term cisgender is just refers to people where their gender identity matches the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, so if you took any kind of chemistry, you know, cis and trans are kind of like, I feel like they're chemistry type terms. So, so some people say like, oh, cisgender is a slur, but it's very much like a, you know, chemistry term in my, in my point of view. But um, this is sort of some basic terminology. But if, if any of this terminology gets confusing or you want me to re-clarify or anything, please let me know. Um, but that's just some basics just to get us started. So we're looking at uh, in the experiment, we're going to be comparing trans women, trans men, non-binary people, and cisgender people. Dr. Button, quick question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Since the focus is going to be on transgender people, is it the whole group, including people who are pre-transitioning and people who are post-transitioning? Yeah, so good. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so like you mentioned, there's going to be sort of a broad spectrum of like to what extent people have transitioned or transitioned at all. So some people, some people will transition surgically. Some people will transition with hormones or not. Some people will not, will do neither both, you know, there's in people are on different kind of points in their particular journey and the journey is different for each person. Um, in this particular study, we're not going to be able to look at that sort of heterogeneity within trans people in terms of where they are in that particular space. Um, what I'm going to show you is the way that we're going to kind of signal for trans or cis status is through people are going to be requesting appointments for therapy and they're going to sometimes slip in an extra sentence that says, I'm a transgender woman, I'm a transgender man, or I'm non-binary, and I'm looking for a trans-friendly therapist. So we are gonna be sort of looking at sort of average differences. And so within that, there's a lot of heterogeneity that we're not gonna capture, unfortunately. So it's not gonna be a situation where the therapist knows where along the transition this person is. They're kind of gonna make a sort of an average assessment of like, how are you know transgender people in general or make sort of assumptions about that. So we're not able to get at that kind of heterogeneity, but I think that would be, interesting because you know discrimination access to care could vary for example when you're going through a transition versus after versus before and so that's not something that we can fully capture but i think that's really interesting so excuse me to kind of continue on this so you're saying we can't yeah. necessarily like because we could think of a situation where maybe the therapist is maybe biased against a transgender person because they know that they might be on some sort of hormone therapy which could make their emotions like a lot more intense or something so yeah yeah absolutely so yeah so we don't we don't know uh yeah so the way this study is currently constructed we don't know um to what extent that's going to be a moderator so yeah it could be that the, the therapist is going to statistically discriminate against trans people because they might assume like okay depending on where you are in your transition like you said there could be different health concerns or you know people could act differently or the other things could be going on um or that's just like a uh, more unstable transition, like big major life transition, right? That maybe has more needs and more concerns. Um, so we can't, we can't fully, fully, we fully quantify that. I think, you know, there's ways to do that, but 
what we're gonna talk about later is we could try to signal where the person is in their transition, but I think there's some external validity concerns there. So, so we're not fully able to get at that, but that's something that I would love to kind of think a little bit more about, maybe discuss with you a little bit more. I think as that would you, be really interesting. Um, as you likely know, Marcella Alsan made her name by studying racial concordance. Um, yeah. And I wondered if you have any information on um, physician identity so that you yeah. would know if there's concordance there. Yeah, yeah, that, and that that's a great point, Debbie, just, yeah. Might be a lot less discrimination that way. Yeah, that's, so I'm gonna come back to that later. So I have a slide that's gonna talk exactly about that. I think that's really important. Okay. So I'm gonna put a pin in that. We're gonna come back to that later if that's okay. Yeah, but absolutely that's something we're gonna look into. We don't have yet, is a, is a quick answer, but I really appreciate that. Patrick, are you gonna uh, just talk to us a little bit about what the, what the lead, this may get at more mechanisms, right? What the what yeah. the legal environment sort of look, you know looks like, and to to what degree some of you know differential responses could reflect risk aversion about interactions that could lead to you know uh, uh, worse legal kind of out, out, outcomes later. Yeah, so that's going to be thing, yeah. interacting in the wrong way. I'm, I'm yeah. sure I'm not alone in sort of saying that, you know, people sort of that are that are sort of new to this literature, even attending this seminar, want to make sure they don't say the wrong thing. Um, right. And, and so I'm just wondering the extent to which, you know, what 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 is the, the, the context institutionally of the of the of the of the legal environment about this? Yeah, so I don't have too much of that on here. I am going to in a later in later slides near the end of this, so the first half of this kind of talk about how we're going to try to test for if discrimination is moderated by state levels laws that deal with trans people. So some of the legal context is going to be that there's generally no like federal protections around discrimination based on gender identity, you know, in federal law, but some states do have like discrimination protections that include healthcare access and discrimination in healthcare situations. But so some states have that have coverage and some states don't. So we're going to eventually use that to see, do we see more discrimination against trans people in states that um, you know, don't have these protections versus do. And then some states, as we know, have sort of anti-trans laws. It could be sort of a religious freedom law um, where um, people can, based on their religious beliefs, sort of deny services based on LGBT status, or it could be something like a bathroom bill that's not directly tied to, you know, discrimination against trans people and access to medical care, but could create sort of a cultural environment that's sort of less favorable towards trans people. So um, we haven't done the full analysis of exactly what that legal variation is, and we don't have stats on like which states have which law, but that's something that's on our list of things to look at a little bit later. So I'll get into that a little bit more. Okay, um, so let me get a little bit of background. Um, so uh, in terms of sort of context here, so as a lot of us are probably aware of, so trans people, uh, you know, face a lot of sort of disparities in terms of mental health and other factors. Um, so higher rates of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, um, suicidal ideation. Um, and there's, there's not too much research on trans people because they can be hard to study. There's not a lot of data sets a lot of data sets are really, really bad at dealing with gender identity separately from sex. So, you know, you know, like a lot of, we have a lot of data sets just have like male, female, and that's it. And that's obviously not really the full picture. Um, but, you know, some research, oftentimes experimental, like what we're doing or other, other research is finding some evidence of discrimination and access uh, based on trans status and access to primary care, employment, housing, and education, food, or access to justice. Um, and another sort of motivating factor, especially for intersectional groups, is going to be the idea of minority stress. So um, people that are minorities face more stressors and this is, they have more mental health concerns. And that's sort of behind some of the disparities we see where people of color or queer people are more likely to have anxiety, depression, etc. And that's going to be uh, compounded when people have multiple mi uh, minority identities. So intersectional people, for example, like Black trans women, as an example. So, um, you know, uh, trans people face these larger health care disparities and they're more likely to need health care because they face more health, uh, mental health care issues, but then there could be discrimination that sort of frustrates their ability to get access to those particular services when they need them a little bit more. Um, in terms of the literature on experimental evidence of discrimination, this is sort of my thing. Um, there is less research on discrimination and access to health care, but there are some really great studies that do what I'm going to propose, which is sort of an audit field experiment to try to come up with an experimental measure of access to health care by varying patients, by 
you know, race or other factors. And so coming up with a controlled experiment to study discrimination. So there's a lot of work on uh, discrimination access to primary care. So some of it deals with um, how socioeconomic status affects discrimination, insurance status, race or ethnicity or gender. Um, and there's only a couple of studies, about three with very, very small samples, even smaller than my pilot study sample that tries to do an experiment to look at discrimination and access to mental health care. These mostly focus on African-American versus white, which I have partly in my study. Um, so we have a little bit of evidence here from very small samples, kind of underpowered, that might have a little bit of evidence on discrimination and access to mental health care, but there's not too much here. And then nothing really on trans people like whatsoever. There are only a couple of studies broadly speaking, are experiments that look at discrimination against trans people. And one's, I think, a, a resume study, and there's one sort of very, very small sample of housing discrimination. But generally, there's not too much here on this particular question. So we don't know really to what extent uh, discrimination is a factor in terms of access to mental health care for this particular group that really needs that kind of care. OK. Um, so what are our major research questions here? So we're looking at do trans and non-binary people and when I'm saying trans and non-binary separately, just to focus on the fact that we look at those groups separately, but generally we think of non-binary as falling within the transgender umbrella, but do trans and non-binary people face discrimination in access to appointments with mental health practitioners, so MHPs, so apologies for the acronyms, but NHP is gonna be our way of saying mental health practitioner. Um, and if there is discrimination, um, do we see that there's sort of intersectional discrimination where uh, people of color who are trans face more discrimination. And we can also separately look at, is discrimination in general uh, based on race and ethnicity? So we're gonna be varying, does the person transgender, non-binary or cisgender? And then we're gonna vary if the person has an African-American, Hispanic or white sounding name. And then we can look at those intersections as well. So the early results, this is from our pilot study of a thousand observations, which is probably large for a pilot study, but not large enough we wanna publish it yet. Uh, we do find that trans and non-binary people face discrimination, but only really, trans and non-binary people that are African-American Hispanic. So the general takeaway from this is gonna be that there's really only intersectional discrimination. And it's harder to say if there's discrimination against individual groups, but the intersectional group definitely faces discrimination. So let me kind of set up the experiment and then we'll get into the results a little bit. Then I'm gonna talk about what I think is what people are gonna find more interesting, which is sort of like all these sort of moderators of discrimination to see like where discrimination occur more, where the mechanisms will get more into that because there's been a lot of really good feedback on that. And I wanna make sure that we focus on that. So that's gonna be a little bit later on once I get through the setup and the results, but feel free to jump in um, anytime. That's been really uh, helpful. Okay. So we're gonna be auditing the behavior of mental health providers. So this is done through an audit field experiment. So basically you can think of it like a kind of a secret shopper. So we're sort of looking to you know, pose as, you know, fictitious patients that are realistic, that are sending kind of normal patient requests. And we're gonna experimentally vary the demograph the demography of the of the of the prospect of patients. So we're gonna vary their race and ethnicity through name. And then we're gonna vary if the person is trans or non binary or cisgender through a simple statement to the person saying that I'm looking for a trans friendly therapist. So I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, and so on average, the appointment requests are going to be the same on average. So any difference is going to be uh, just any difference in response is going to be due to the fact that it's just a minority status. So we can really direct, right, directly isolate but hold everything constant. What effect, you know, being trans versus cis has on appointment offers or being African-American versus white uh, is on appointment offer. So we're able to, with this experimental approach, observe actual, actual behavior, like actual appointment offers. Um, so that's why we call it like a field experiment. And then we can control for everything. So there's these sort of benefits to why we're using an audit field experiment here. Obviously there's downsides to it, but uh, we think that we get sort of a clean estimate of actual discrimination in a real environment. Okay, so the data set we're using is going to be um, Psychologist Data has a finite therapist database where if you've ever searched for therapists like I have, uh, you probably use this database. It's the largest database in the world on therapists. And uh, in the US, there's um, over a quarter of a million therapists on that website. It's a huge database, only costs $30 a month to put your profile on there as a therapist. So you know, the cost is pretty low, but the benefits are quite large if you're looking for, uh, for looking for patients. So it's sort of the most uh, developed website. And I'll show you a screenshot of the website, but basically you can search for a lot of different criteria. Like you can look in particular areas for a therapist. You can search based on like specialty or gender of the therapist or, you know, what they focus on or things like that. So what kind of insurance they take, et cetera. So there's a lot of like search terms you can put in there. Uh, we're going to be sort of looking for therapists in general that work on common concerns that almost all therapists work on, which is going to be um, anxiety, depression, stress. So I'll mention that in a minute, but let's get into a little bit more on the, oh, there's a question. 
Yeah, quick question. So yeah. for the 1,000 uh, MHPs, did you randomize the uh, races of your, uh, who, I'm going to say actor here, but uh, yeah. Uh, was that randomized or was, was each MHP tested for each race? Uh, right. Used that's a great question. So currently what, we're, what we did in this pilot study is we only sent each of them one email. So we randomized 50% chance that, that they get an email from a white person, 25% African-American, 25% Hispanic. Yeah. In the future, we're probably going to send two emails. So we're going to do sort of a match pair design where one's going to be white and one's going to be either African-American or Hispanic, or we're just going to randomly select two different um, possibilities. But in this current results, we only sent one email. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so, so, so we'll start with what the, the MHPs look like in terms of the sample, then I'll, I'll get into sort of how we're creating these uh, prospective patients. Um, so we have a thousand mental health practitioners and we roughly have a nationally representative sample. So we sample them roughly based on state population. And then we try to select, um, we have the RA search by zip code. So they'll put in a zip code that they're assigned and they'll search for therapists in that general area. Oftentimes they won't have that many therapists in that particular zip code if it's sort of smaller so, you know, they'll get results for near, like further away, but that's, that's totally, that's totally fine. So we're kind of mimicking sort of a localized search. And so we're generally sampling the zip codes with respect to population. Uh, so we're, we have a nationally representative sample, and then I can later on, you know, reweight if we have some slight imbalances, because there's always an intent to have a balanced sample, and then you over under sample unintentionally. And so we can also in later robustness checks do some reweighting there. Uh, but the, but the sample is going to be nationally representative. And we think that's really important because, um, you know, we want to sort of have a population representative estimate of discrimination, but then also, as a lot of you have sort of mentioned, there's sort of these factors that can moderate discrimination. And as I've discussed with a lot of you in meetings, there's all these factors that are sort of regional that could sort of affect discrimination. So as, as Joe said, it could be state level discrimination laws, or we could think of, you know, LGBTQ or race, uh, attitudes around race or LGBTQ people could vary by region or, so certain status or education levels. And those are all factors that could, or, or demographics and those things could matter. So I'll talk later about how we're gonna leverage that geographic variation to see if those moderate discrimination. But that was one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure that we had a national sample so that we could get that variation while also getting a population representative sample. Can I ask, a, sorry to sound like an IRB person. I'm just curious, do they do, are, are there any, in, in this sort of online market, are, are, are there any, obviously sort of no mechanisms to, 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 to verify the existence kind of of the, of the potential patient, what sort of safety protections are sort of in there about these, uh, uh, about the kind of matching going on? I know this has been an issue for the, you know, on, on online portals for sort of child care and the, in the conducting of these kinds of studies that have started limiting the ability mm. to put up fake profiles and things like that. So, so what's the what's the what's the status of this site um, to today and what kind of yeah that's a good question. So I think on the therapist side, in, in terms of putting their ad on there, um, I, I if I, we haven't like tried to make our own profile on there, but I think we looked at the process and I think there's a lot of paper, a decent amount of paper to fill out where you often have to have a license and you have to you know be able to prove you have a license before you can make a profile. I believe all the profiles on there mention some kind of a license. Um, that they have. Um, obviously, you know, that could be spoofed. I don't know the context of childcare, uh, but I think generally the people that are, you know, posing as therapists on there are, are legitimate. These are people that have practices that have been practicing for a long time. They mentioned specific degrees. So I don't think there's too much concern about that, but maybe that's relevant in a couple of cases. So we'll have to look into it. Um, so I don't think that's a problem there, but I think you had another question on IRB issues, or did I miss? No, that? no. I, I was just sort of re related to about about how you on your side of things, can yeah. Sort of inter, you know, in the way you're interacting with 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 them. So there's nothing you have to post or be made available. You can just sort of directly contact and have your yeah. So so we can yeah yeah. So we contact um, MHPs that have the profiles on here, and they say that they're 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 looking for new patients, and they have an email me button that you can click, and you can send them a message. Um, so that's sort of what's going on here. And so, uh, we think that, you know, all, basically all these MHPs are going to be people that, uh, you know, are looking for patients and they're probably legitimate, legitimate therapists. Oh, and as Ben mentioned, there's a sort of a verified condition that I guess sort of like the blue check mark, so to speak, that you can get probably by submitting extra paperwork. 
we could even see if that affects the results, but we think this is a pretty legit sample of, of therapists. Yeah. And so I'm going to go through kind of how we send the messages and things like that. So any kind of questions clarifying like that are really helpful. So, um, so in terms of our, we have sort of exclusion restriction because what we're looking for is therapists, or MHPs that deal with sort of common concerns. So we're going to be in this uh, study focusing on people who have anxiety, depression, or stress, which are very, very common mental health concerns. We're not looking for therapists based on if they like specialize in trans issues or not. We're looking at sort of discrimination and access to sort of common, men common but important mental health care. So our exclusion criteria slash inclusion criteria are that the the MHP can't specialize exclusively in say children or couples therapy or grief or something very specialized. They have to be able to accommodate um, these sort of general issues. Um, we're looking at um, sending messages to individuals rather than some kind of an office. So, we, so if they're like a profile where it's like, you know, you don't know who the message is going to, we don't want to send one there just because it's harder than to sort of pair that information with like demographic information on the MHP, which as one of you mentioned, that's gonna be important to look at. Um, and they have to provide an option to contact them through a web form. So most of the profiles have a little button you can click that says, you know, email me. And then, so we're gonna be contacting them through that web form where we type in basically our email through web form. Um, and they have to be accepting patients. So we don't wanna message people that are, indicate that they're not currently accepting patients. It's very easy to know if they're not because they can on their profile at the top, put a little flag up there that says, I'm currently not accepting patients. And if you were to click on email me to them at the top, it would say, I'm currently not accepting patients. So you got, you got reminded twice that they're not currently accepting patients. So we don't email any of those people. Okay, here's an example of what a profile looks like. It's obviously cut off. There's more information down there at the bottom, but the profiles have a lot of data. So we'll talk about how we're gonna try to leverage some of this data, but you get a big sort of narrative around like, here's sort of my training, my philosophy on, on therapy. You get their location, content information, you get their specialties. Uh, sort of in green here where they can only pick three sort of things that they specialize in and then they can sort of list anything that they can treat sort of as issues there they can mention if they look at particular types of clients they can mention if they're lgbtq allied or not um, they can mention what kind of insurance status they they take they can mention their degrees so there's a lot of information here so later on um i'll kind of explain how we're planning to use this data we we currently in this iteration of the draft don't use too much data on the therapists themselves, but we have a lot of plans for how we're gonna use this data because it's quite detailed. But this is sort of how uh, the profile looks for a particular therapist. So they're all kind of of this nature and have a lot of this sort of data. And you can see that email me button and that's what the research assistant's gonna to click to then um, uh, type into the web form to send an email to them. Okay, so in terms of how we come up with our fictitious patients, uh, that are looking for uh, mental health care appointments. Uh, half of them are white, quarter African-American, quarter Hispanic. I'll get into how I use names to signal that. And then independently from that, we randomize whether the person is trans or non-binary. So a quarter of them are gonna be trans, a quarter are gonna be non-binary, then half of them are gonna be cisgender. And then within that, it's either 50% male, female. Um, so we have 100 fictitious patients and each of them send 10 emails to therapists in their area. So. Um, they send sort of 10 emails. Um, and so that gives us 100 patients times 10 emails, 1,000 MHPs, 1,000 observations. And it's sort of a nationally representative uh, sample. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you have this concern or have heard about this concern, but um, we were doing what a lot of previous studies have done, audio field experiments have done, where we signal um, race ethnicity through name. So you can think of African-American sounding, Hispanic sounding, white sounding names. Uh, there's a common critique of that in which is sort of like name selected isn't sort of random. Um, you know, there can be, the name might also signal socioeconomic status, right? So it could be that, for example, maybe African-American names are more commonly used by certain types of African-American families. Um, and so the name could signal something in addition to race. That's a, that's a common critique. There's several papers I can point you towards on that. There's a lot of discussion of literature around that. Uh, to summarize though, we're trying to partially address this critique so we can't you know, fully get around this issue. So it could still be that our names that we use have some signals about socioeconomic status in addition to race ethnicity. But one thing that we do is we leverage some recent research by economist sociologists where they actually tried to figure out if there was any associations between certain first names and parental, um, uh, paternal or mother, mother's maternal education 
So they have the education level of the mom and they can see how that relates to certain names by race and ethnicity. These are also names where they test it to see if people perceive them as African-American, Hispanic, or white. So we're gonna be using first names and last names that are tested to signal race ethnicity that are also gonna vary in the socioeconomic status of that first name. So the idea here is that some first, some first names are more likely to be given uh, to kids whose mothers are more educated and some first names are more likely to be given to kids whose uh, mothers are less educated. So we can try to vary the SES signal through the name. Obviously this is gonna be noisy, but it's our way to try to pick names that sort of have more variance in terms of S possible SES signals to try to better control for, but imperfectly control for this concern about uh, to what extent African-American Hispanic names might signal social status. So as an example of some of the names we use, um, the names on the left in these, uh, these uh, boxes are gonna be ones that are associated with a higher maternal uh, education. And then the, the name on the right is gonna be one that is lower maternal education. Um, so these are just some examples. So for example, Darius versus Deshaun. And so we're gonna be using um, first and last names that are for, for African-Americans are gonna be an African-American first name and an African-American last name. And then same thing for Hispanic people and for white people. So we're gonna be signaling through first and last name, but from the research it indicates that most of the signal comes from the first name is gonna be the primary way that uh, that racism is gonna be signaled is through that first name. Okay, um, very important thing. How do we signal gender identity? So that's something that is like, you know, you know, tricky subject because it's not like, you know, we wanna, we wanna kind of do this in a way that's externally valid. So we don't want it to be like, hey, I'm trans, you know, out of nowhere it would be a little bit weird, right? Um, so what we wanna do is sort of signal in a way that's sort of natural where it would normally be mentioned in sort of a way that we think is externally valid. So, you know, as a queer person, like I searched for therapy myself. And so I think I, even before I was doing this study, I wrote up a more detailed version of the emails we're sending. You know, I mentioned like, hey, I'm an academic who burns out all the time and I have bad like work-life balance and I need to learn how to say no, da, 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 da. By the way, I'm gay and I'm looking for someone who's gay friendly. You know, I didn't have any like, you know, queer specific concerns that I needed for my therapist. But I, you know, I mentioned that, that I was gay because I wanted to make sure that like, they weren't gonna like discriminate against me or they were like chill about it, right? Because you want to have a therapist who's sort of affirming of your sexual orientation and gender identity. And so I have a therapist who's a straight guy and he's awesome, so yay. Um, so what we're doing here is basically the way that we signal gender identity is by adding one additional sentence to the email, uh, appointment request email. So we'll show you what the example email looks like. We're just adding one more sentence to it where it's gonna say, I'm a transgender woman or transgender man or non-binary, and I'm looking for a trans-friendly therapist. Um, so we think that that's gonna be a common way to signal that that's more externally valid. So obviously there's a question of if you signal or not, but what we think is, um, we think that there's sort of this, um, um, there's some research or some you know articles that talk about like, if you're a queer person, you might want to make sure that you're your, your healthcare practitioner is someone who is sort of, you know, LGBTQ affirming. So there's other sort of websites that mention that if you're a queer person, you might want to mention this in your appointment request just to make sure that, you know, you're not discriminated against. And I've done it myself. So we think there's anecdotal evidence that suggests that it's not too unusual to mention this sort of a thing. So we don't think it's going to be too unusual of a signal because there's always concerns with these kind of audit studies that signal something that's not like a visible minority status, like maybe a disability, where you could kind of choose if you want to disclose it or not. And you would probably not disclose it if you think you're going to face discrimination. We think this is a context where it would often be disclosed because it's relevant. Uh, but our goal here is to look at discrimination and access to general mental health care appointments. So, you know, general anxiety, general stress, general depression. And so the only mention of transness is gonna be through this sentence. And so we're trying not to signal that, that the person has a trans specific concern. Okay. All right, so this is sort of our kind of like way that you know we kind of construct our messages. So this is what it's gonna look like if we were to like make it into like a puzzle or something where we can slot everything in. I'll show you an example message shortly. Uh, so basically it's gonna be a simple kind of like Hi, my name is insert name that signals race slash gender slash ethnicity. I'm contacting you because I'm dealing with stress or depression or anxiety, and I'd like to talk to a therapist. And then if they're trans or non-binary, then we add an extra sentence where I'm non-binary and looking for a trans-friendly therapist. If they're cisgender, there's no mention of that at all because it would weird, be weird for the person to say like, I'm cisgender. Um, so just the people that don't have that included are sort of presumed to be cisgender. 
Um, and then there's a sentence where there's an appointment request like, uh, are you available for appointments? Can I set up an appointment? And then thanks and then name. So it's pretty small, short message, which I, I talked to some therapists and they sort of mentioned that the, the emails they get tend to be pretty short like this. Uh, so this is an example. So you can see where Ben was nice has to highlight the spots here where we add in sort of a particular randomized element. So, um, so we have the name in there, we have anxiety versus depression versus stress. Then we have the extra sentence for trans and non-binary people. Um, and then we also vary sort of the phrasing. So on average, all these email requests are gonna be the same, except we're gonna vary those factors experimentally. So Patrick, I have a quick question. So yeah. how prevalent are uh, therapists who focus just on trans issues? So what I'm getting at is, you know, if you get, uh, if you don't get a call back, is it because they think you're a better match with other therapists that are around or yeah, um, is it discrimination? Yeah, that's a really good point. So relatively few therapists specialize in LGBTQ issues. At some point, we're going to mine the data that's available on the website to see like what proportion mention, you know, being, you know, LGBTQ allies, how many mention a specialty in that, how many mention that they're, you know, interested in that kind of you know, community. So I don't have the stats on it, but it's going to be a smaller version, a smaller part of the entire sample. There is a separate concern about like, this is something that I'll get to a little bit later, I think, it, where like, you know, there, there's the therapist could be, you know, seeing that like sentence, like I'm looking for some trans friendly and kind of think, oh, this person has like trans specific concerns, or this person would benefit more from a trans specialist. So one possible reaction could that it is, reactions could be to like uh, give them a referral to someone who's trans specialist. I'll talk a little bit about that later because there's going to be some sort of uh, possible um, responses that are sort of ambiguous as, in terms of they could be good or bad. And so I'll kind of talk about how we deal with that uh, in, in a bit, but that's a really good point. Um, this is just the distribution of what everything looks like. So um, they already kind of went through that. I'm going to kind of go through quickly because I realized that I've already spent a lot of time. Um, so um, uh, I'll kind of go through this quickly. So we get responses back from them. So we get reply emails. Um, in the in the actually in the um, one thing I remembered is in the pilot. So we actually had people list phone numbers. So we also sometimes got voicemails, but we got some kind of a voicemail or an email, usually an email response back, and so we put them into different categories. So the the, the categories we got are uh, seventy five percent of the time there's going to be some kind of a response, and twenty five percent of the time we're just ghosted. We don't get any kind of response at all. Um, and the conditional on getting response, it could be an appointment offer, like, yeah, let's have an appointment or let's have an appointment. Or it's going to be what we call a call or consultation offer where they say, yeah, let's talk about this on the phone. Or, yeah, we can set up a consultation. We consider both of those as, as our positive outcomes for our default specification. And then what we consider negative, which we'll show you some robustness stuff, uh, we'll talk about robustness later, is uh, another possibility is referral. So they don't give an appointment, but they say, oh, you, you might want to consider this person. Some of those referrals are gonna be sort of passing the buck where they just don't wanna say no and they're gonna to try to be nice and be like, well, I can't see you, but here's this rando who could possibly see you. Um, or they could be trying to refer you to someone who might be a better fit, like, oh, here's a trans specialist you should talk to. So we're gonna dig into that a little bit more. So that's gonna be sort of a more ambiguous outcome. Screening question is more likely to be a negative outcome where they're asking something like, uh, what kind of insurance do you have? So they're asking for information that would determine if they would later give an appointment or not. A little bit more ambiguous of a situation, but generally, what we see in some of these pilot results, what we see in some of these other studies is that people of color, for example, are asked screening questions more often. So they can sometimes face more sort of conditionalities on their access to care. And then more, more clearly negative response is going to be putting on, put them on a wait list or a network rejection. Like they're nice enough to respond back and say no. Um, or the most common thing is going to be no response at all. Quick question. So for yeah. the referrals, did you uh, follow up with the doctors that they referred to to see if like they were actually going to respond or not respond yeah um so so we haven't done that so we haven't um we haven't for example contacted those they referred to so said oh you should talk to bob smith we didn't then try to audit bob smith so we didn't do that um but we do know who they referred us to and in future data analysis we're going to try to see if we can learn more about like, are these good or bad referrals? And there's different ways we can try to look at that. But, but we don't have any intention of auditing who they, uh, who they um, refer us to. I, don't, I, I had to think more about that, but I'm inclined to not, to not do that. But that's not what we currently do anyways. But I'll think more about that. That's a good point. Uh, so here's quickly sort of the distribution of the data. So 
uh, roughly three quarters, uh, 56.6% of the time we get a positive response. So an appointment or a call or consultation offer. And these are sort of the breakdown of the category. So most of the negative responses are gonna just be no response at all. But we get a couple of cases of being like waitlisted or outright rejected. Um, but most of it's gonna be a decently clear appointment consultation offer versus no response. It's gonna be most of where the variation is here. I'm not going to go through all this, but this is what the, you know, the basic summary statistics look like by group and by type of response. Um, I'm not going to present the results here. Our results are robust to an alternative coding where I mentioned how you might consider screening questions still kind of positive response or referral could still be positive. So we try a version where we include screening questions for referrals as positive versus negative. And our results are generally robust to that categorization, which is good. Um, the, the kind of things that jump out here are going to be that, generally speaking, there's going to be lower appointment offers for trans and non-binary people, and there's going to be generally lower appointment offers for African-American Hispanic people. Um, most of that's going to be just higher rejection rates for, for minority groups, because that's where most of the action is, is just like no response at all. Um, but you do see, for example, um, you know, African-Americans are more likely to be asked screening questions, for example, but most of that's going to become into sort of like differences and non-response is going to be the main difference there. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, but this is just sort of showing basic sort of difference in means test. So typically what we do with this experimental data is, is everything is on average the same. We can kind of do a simple difference in means test first, and then we kind of build up to a regression where we control for more factors. Usually what we control for is doesn't really matter because everything is randomized, but you know, it's, it's easier to look at intersectional differences and things like that, or moderator effects in a regression format. But we start with these basic these basic tests. I'm just going to quickly skip over this because I'll get us straight to the regression results because I want to make sure we have time for more comments and questions and discussions of what we're going to do next. So I'll just kind of skip through that. Um, and we'll look at sort of what the regression looks like. So we're going to be regressing our positive outcome indicator, so zero, one variable. Regress that on indicator for if the person trans non-binary. We're first going to be looking at the aggregate group, so trans non-binary together as a group. Uh, then uh, indicator for African American or Hispanic, and then seeing if response rates differ for those with depression and anxiety. We're not going to focus on that. And then we're going to include some state and time fixed effects. And um, right now we don't have too many control variables. Like for example, in later analysis, we're going to add in, you know, control variables around the um, information on the therapist themselves. Uh, we're going to cluster our standards to the patient level since each patient sends 10 messages. Um, and then we'll show you results after this first specification where we look at intersectionality. So currently, this regression is just going to look at how does trans differ from cis and how does African American differ from white. But obviously, there's intersectional discrimination. That's where we're, where we're going to see the results. And so, in the next couple of slides, I'll get into that. But we'll start with the basics first, where we don't look at intersectionality, and then we'll add that in in column two. So, column one is going to be our base specification. And so what we see from the base investigation is we have statistically significantly lower um, appointment offer rates for African American and Hispanic prospective patients. So the mean um, positive response rate for cisgender white people, which is sort of the reference group here, is going to be 61.5%. So if you're African American and we're looking at column one, your response rate is 13.3 percentage points lower response rate. So just under 50%, like 48% or so. So that's a, a pretty big difference uh, in terms of the response rate. But what we see is that these results are extremely moderated by intersectionality. So um, what we see when we sort of break these results into these intersectional groups is that what's actually interesting is we don't find in the, in the first results, we don't really find much of a difference between trans non-binary and cisgender. So in column one, we see a very small estimate that is not significant at all. Given the standard error is a little bit big, but we, the magnitude of that coefficient is quite small. So we don't see any sort of difference in terms of response rates between trans people and cisgender people in general. But once we look at trans people by race, that's, that's where we see these sort of effects. So what we're seeing actually, which is a little bit perplexing to us, is we're seeing some evidence of and actually maybe a higher response rate for white trans people compared to white cis people. But then we see uh, lower response rates for trans people of color. Um, and then, so we break this down here. What we tend to see is that the discrimination tends to be concentrated in people of color, particularly people of color who are trans non-binary. Uh, so that's what we're seeing in these, these particular results right now. Um, so generally speaking, I'm not gonna go through all the robustness checks, all the specifications, but the general takeaway from these results is gonna be that conclusion that the discrimination is intersectional, mostly against trans non-binary people of color. That's gonna be a fairly robust conclusion, but we're gonna have, we're gonna be a little bit more inconclusive on if there's going to be 
racial ethnic discrimination in general. So for example, do cis people who are African-American or Hispanic face discrimination? We have noisy estimates there. And it's hard to say if there's a, the, we don't really have strong evidence of discrimination against um, white trans non-binary people. There's maybe a little bit of evidence of some preference, but that's really weak evidence there. So the mainly sort of robust evidence, the big takeaway is gonna be that there is discrimination that seems significant about the, against this intersectional group. Well, uh, why is it, sorry, Patrick, well, well, yeah. I mean, is, is it because of the stars are gonna go away sort of later? But yeah, no, I mean, I'm actually interested given that magnitude on why white cisgender men, why the therapists don't wanna see them, rel you know, relative to, 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 to trans. What is it about yeah. white cisgender men? That right, is, right. Uh, so that's something that we do wanna dig into a little bit more. So it could be that like, you know, with counselors, therapists, like we, we tend to think of them more altruistic, these are the type of people that do care about, you know, health disparities, things like that. And so they may actually want to try to help marginalized populations. Maybe it's just that they're more interested in trans people as a marginalized population. So that could be what's going on. We do want to dig into that more. And we're hoping we can really dig into it more once we have the bigger sample, because I 100% agree that that is really a fascinating result, right? And it would be kind of a relief to, to in, this, in this particular narrow context, actually find like the opposite of discrimination, because I'm usually disappointed all the time at like, you know, as someone who's discrimination, like this, oh, like, they hate these people, they hate these people, you know, so getting that kind of positive result be interesting. So I do want to dig into that. So I, I totally agree. Uh, but, but right now that is sort of a non robust finding. So I don't want to be too conclusive about it. But it's something that we are going to focus on absolutely going forward. So I completely agree. With that. That's really interesting. These are sort of breaking it out a little bit more looking even more at intersectionality. We are getting some, some smaller cell sizes here. But we do see again that the discrimination tends to be against um, uh, trans people of color. With, with some evidence of a preference towards um, white trans people. So sort of similar results to earlier, but the results get a little bit noisier, but a little bit stronger here when we break it out into particular subgroups. We're gonna have more power to really detect more of these differences more cleanly once we have the larger sample size. So this is only a thousand observations, but we do find some pretty significant effects, but some of these magnitudes are quite large. So I do think there is some noise here that we're seeing in these results. Um, okay, so there's a lot of caveats here. I'll quickly mention a couple. So we are eventually going to be looking at the data like from that huge kind of profile that we see from the MHP. We're going to mine that to sort of put in a bunch of control variables that might soak up some of the noise in our data. But more importantly, we're going to use that to see if we can find factors that moderate discrimination. Um, and then this is something that Joe and others have sort of talked about is it's important to kind of know to what extent discrimination is taste-based versus statistical. The idea is broadly understanding the mechanisms of discrimination. So for those who are not economists, the idea behind taste-based discrimination is some discrimination is sort of like, I just don't like a particular group. But some discrimination could be sort of assumptions are made about the group, like with imperfect information, you may make assumptions about groups. So for example, I might make an assumption that people of color have like worse insurance status, or I might make an assumption that trans people have more pressing or delicate or difficult mental health concerns. And then treating people based on those particular assumptions would be correct or not. And so that kind of can kind of tell us what's behind discrimination in terms of the mechanism. So we can see, is it sort of animus? Is it based on particular assumptions? Because what we're going to do, and I'll explain, is we're going to vary some of the information in the emails and the next wave of the analysis to try to get at the mechanism. So this is obviously lackluster in terms of what we can show right now, but we have some plans to try to dig into this a little bit more, which I'll go through. Okay. Um, so some next steps, uh, we're going to continue data collection. So we, we um, ended up running through about February to May uh, 2021. And then we, we collected a thousand observations, kind of paused there. We tried to restart, but we got into some data issues, which I'm not going to talk too much about, but we just ran into issues where our emails weren't getting through for some kind of technical reason. We're trying to fix that. Uh, we have the funding through an NSF grant that we can probably meet what I hope is going to be our minimum sample size of at least 5,000 or so therapists, but we can go beyond that. Um, but we'll eventually have more data here, so we have sufficient power to look at maybe perhaps some more intersectionality or moderate effects. So this is sort of the start of a larger data collection, hence why your comments are really helpful, so I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to quickly go through this, um, but I, I want to talk a little bit about filing a pre-analysis plan. The idea here is it's pretty common to do this in development economics or other fields where you do field experiments, where you kind of pre-specify what you're going to do. So we're going to be doing that without pre-specifying too much. So let me just skip ahead a little bit here. Here I'm kind of talking about pros and cons of pre-analysis plans. What we're going to do here for our plan is 
we're going to file a plan that's going to try to prevent you know us from data mining or doing any sneaky things but then not tie our hands too much in terms of restricting what we can do with the data so we're going to set a minimum sample size where uh you if we if we exceed that sample size we're going to present results with the original sample size of 5342 mhps but then we'll also present the sample size with the full data set the idea is you could be concerned that someone could just collect data to a certain point once they get results and then stop like sort of a stopping rule um and try to avoid that we're going to sort of commit to like we will you know do our analysis with this smaller data set too and show if we have different results to try to avoid that potential issue and then um we'll pre-specify our main outcome variables because there's some subjectivity in how we code our outcome variables we're going to say here's how we're going to commit to doing it as, as a default because you want to kind of avoid p hacking or in a sort of extreme cases where there's a lot of outcome variables not relevant for us but other studies have that when there's a lot of outcome variables you could foreseeably like pick and choose to build your paper on the ones that are significant. So the idea is that we're kind of following other literature by filing a pre-analysis plan that tries to avoid some of these issues it's by pre-specifying, but not totally tying us to a particular analysis. So we're gonna pre-specify our sample size to some extent and then pre-specify our main data analysis, but not pre-specify every kind of test because we don't wanna tie our hands too much. Um, we're gonna collect additional data from the profiles. So we're gonna look at specialties particularly specialties related to race or LGBT status. Uh, we, can, we can see if the person is uh, like trans um, or gay and lesbian allied. They can kind of mention that on their profile that they're an ally. We can look at training type or degree type. Like some people are social workers, some people are psychologists. We can look at years of experience. Um, we can look at demographics. So I believe one of you mentioned sort of concordances, which is sort of like, it could be that um, you know, therapists of color are less likely to discriminate against um, patients or, or patients of color. And so that could matter. Um, or they're more likely to pick particular types of patients. So we can see how demography of the um, MHC matters. So we can look at what we can observe from the profile and we can also try to run their photos through software that might help us determine gender, race, ethnicity, age, obviously with noise, but we can get some information on that. And then we can also see if their profile mentions LGBTQ status in some way. In a lot of cases we won't know, but we can kind of infer this in some extent. And then we also see if they're, they're allied, for example. Uh, we can look at location. So we can look like, like Joe was mentioning, like what's the legal context here? We can see other state laws that, uh, that, that moderate results. We can look at area demography. So in areas that are more queer or more Hispanic or more African-American, et cetera, or higher SES, do we see that that moderate discrimination? Uh, and then we can try to tie like local attitudes from say, data from the implicit association test, we can see if that is so if more implicit bias associated with more discrimination, we can see that that can allow us to try to see to what extent the discrimination might be taste based where we can see, oh, it looks like in areas that have more racial animus or areas that have more anti LGBTQ attitudes, those are places where we see more discrimination. Um, and then one kind of technical thing I want to do is we have this textual data from the profile narrative. So we have this long profile and um, the MHP like goes through, like here's my philosophy on mental health care, da, da, da. We have a lot of textual data we can use. And so I've been working and some other projects that use sort of machine learning, uh, sentiment analysis tools to try to sort of manage and use that data. So I'm looking to use that data, but we're in the very early stages of that. So obviously a lot of things that we want to do. So this is sort of like more of a wish list than an actual paper. So I appreciate being able to sort of present, you know, only sort of a partial analysis here. If you think of anything that you think we're missing, very helpful to hear that because there's a lot of factors we can look at and we're really excited to kind of look at all these mediators and moderators of discrimination. Questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. So for, I, you said you're going to hopefully be a, a test for racial animus in different areas, right? Yeah. Yeah. How, how are you going to go about doing that? Well, or, um, so the idea is that we're going to have like pre-existing measures that might that sort of correlate with racist attitudes. So the idea is there are some, some questions in the general social survey about race um, that we can use. Obviously it's hard to survey people be like, are you racist, yes or no? Like people aren't gonna answer that kind of question, but there is some data that we can use that's gonna kind of correlate with attitudes about race or LGBTQ people. So that can come from general survey data, sorry, general social survey. There's possibility of getting like tweets and sort of uh, matching those to areas to see like, are there more racist homophobic tweets in particular areas and or transphobic tweets in certain areas? Does that correlate with discrimination against trans people? And then um, there's data from the implicit association test, which is a test you can take online where they have um, IAT, implicit association test scores by I think county. 
And so you can see in counties that tend to show more implicit bias against, say, African Americans, does that correlate with more discrimination against African Americans and access to appointments? So we can't directly test whether each individual therapist, you know, is racist or not. We're going to kind of look at these aggregate geographic measures to see if they correlate with discrimination, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, and, yeah. Okay. Um, and so the next thing we're going to do is add an insurance status. So we don't have any mention of like payment method. What we're going to do is sort of add in 70% of the time mention insurance status. And so we're going to randomize between mentioning Medicaid versus private insurance versus paying out of pocket. In some cases, we'll mention a request for a sliding scale. So sometimes like people are going to pay out of pocket. They don't have insurance, but they're cash constrained. And some MHPs mention, you know, that they have a sliding scale that they offer. So we're going to randomize through those particular payment methods. So we're going to add an extra sentence that discloses, you know, method of payment, or in some cases, just not, not disclose it. So there's a couple of things we get out of that. So by randomizing payment method, we can see how that affects access to care. So there's some literature on how Medicaid, um, people with Medicaid have reduced access to primary care appointments compared to those who pay out of pocket or who pay with insurance. So we have some, you know, audit field experiments, but uh, on um, access to primary care, we have nothing here on mental health care. So we don't know through an experimental process using actual appointment offers, like how having Medicaid affects your access to mental health care. So for example, my therapist does not take Medicaid and it's not because he doesn't like people with Medicaid. He says, oh, you get really low reimbursement rates. So I can make more money if I don't take Medicaid patients. And because I have enough patients I can take, there's no reason for me to take Medicaid patients. So we're trying to quantify to what extent that's going on. Um, we can also look a little bit at, at statistical discrimination. So there might be, for example, an assumption that certain groups are, are more likely to have Medicaid. So it might be a, an assumption based on you know, actual data that African-Americans are more likely to have Medicaid instead of private insurance. And so if we kind of vary, if we disclose versus don't disclose payment method, that could moderate discrimination. So the idea is that discrimination might be higher in the white versus African-American comparison when there's no information on method of payment. We could see more discrimination there compared to when we do mention method of payment. So the idea is that disclosing payment method differentially helps African-Americans more because it sort of means that the uh, mental health practitioners aren't making sort of assumptions about you know, African-Americans being more likely to have Medicaid because now they observe, oh, uh, the person has insurance. So we can vary whether or not the information is provided to see if we can use that to detect to what extent discrimination is statistically linked to the statistical discrimination of assuming particular willingness to pay or ability to pay or insurance status by um, patient demography. Um, da, da, da. Uh, I'm so I have a that. quick question yeah. on the previous. So are there, so I'm trying to think about from the perspective of a therapist who the ideal patient is. And I would imagine it's someone who has good insurance, who is going to, you know, come every yeah. week for 10 years, you know, so like a, a patient who kind of sticks with you. Are there differences across um, cisgender, transgender in terms of, so, so thinking about the result about uh, white trans people having the highest response rates, do they tend to, you know, go to therapy consistently over a long period of time versus, you know, someone else who maybe does it for a shorter amount of time? Are there, do we know about any differences along that dimension? Yeah, um, so there's, there's a little bit of research on that. There's sort of, this isn't really research, but there's a really commonly cited psych counseling paper where they argue that counselor therapists prefer clients that are YAVIS, which is an acronym like Y-A-V-I-S, which is young, attractive, verbal, intelligent, and I can't remember what the S is, maybe Ben knows. Uh, successful, thank you. Got it, okay, I knew it was something related to that, but I just, is a tip of my tongue, yes. So we do know that there's sort of anecdotal evidence of um, therapists preferring that. Um, we have to dig into a little bit more if there's more evidence on that. But when I did a quick literature review, I didn't, I didn't find too much on exactly what therapists prefer. But one thing we're going to need to do, like you said, to motivate the insurance side of this is sort of find more anecdotal evidence on like how, to what extent therapists sort of look at insurance status and how that sort of plays on their side. So we can kind of motivate that particular analysis. But uh, so we don't know too much, but we do think that they prefer um, you know, there, there seems to be racist preferences or whatnot. Um, if we sit more generally in society, there seems to be a preference for higher social status um, and more communicative and more attractive and younger uh, uh, patients is generally what we're, what we're seeing anecdotally. But we want to dig into that more. That's a good point. Uh, really quickly, we're planning to also include Chinese names in our next round. Uh, 
easy to motivate this by the fact that that's a group that's obviously understudied, but it's an important part of society. And there's been an increase in discrimination against um, Asian Americans um, due to COVID-19, unfortunately. Um, okay, so I know I'm running out of time here. So this is gonna be really quick, but luckily this is a shorter version of the paper because we don't have too much on here, but I apologize, I didn't leave enough time for Ben's part here, but I do appreciate all the comments I've gotten so far. So this is uh, Ben signal lead on this paper. Uh, we're basically looking at the existing experiment happened to have been run during COVID. So the idea here is our, our data set's gonna span February to May of 2020. So we overlap with the initial onset of the paper. So story here is how does the initial onset of COVID-19 affect access to mental health care appointments? So it's not gonna, we wish we were able to collect data through all the entire pandemic, but that was difficult given everything else going on. And then we got hit by some other exogenous thing that made it difficult to collect data. So this is just gonna be looking at initial onset. So from February to May of 2020. Um, so don't have to motivate this too much, but obviously COVID-19 was a big event and especially had big impacts on mental health. So it could, you know, exacerbated depression, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, led a lot of people to have to do telehealth or, um, and whatnot are people losing jobs. There's sort of a lot of things going on that could affect um, demand for appointments. So in some ways, demands could rise because there's more mental health concerns. Demand for appointments could fall because people are losing health insurance or they're otherwise distracted or they lose income. On the supplier side with mental health uh, practitioners, there, there's likely to be a reduced supply because you know people are facing these challenges and they can't offer therapy in person. There's maybe less demand for that and everyone's facing these challenges so it's harder to offer your services. Um, so what we're trying to do is see generally how um, the uh, intensity of the COVID-19 pandemic associates with access to mental health care appointments. And we're able to measure access through this sort of experimental methods. We're able to see like actual appointment offers. So we can actually see um, so actual access to appointments uh, and how it varies by COVID-19. So we were lucky enough that this happened to, this horrible event happened at sort of the quote unquote right time. Um, and so let me skip some of that motivation. Um, let's get into some of the results here. So the preliminary results are gonna be that um, if COVID-19 is more intense, that tends to lead to re reduce access and appointments, which I don't think is too surprising, but it's important to quantify. And it seems like it's a pretty moderate effect. Um, and uh, holding COVID-19 intensity constant, non-white patients still receive fewer response rates. Uh, so we still see that, you know, you know, once you control for COVID-19, we still see some of the discrimination we saw in the, the previous results. Uh, one thing we wanted to look at, but we don't have much results on because they're extremely noisy and we don't see too much going on is we're also trying to see if COVID-19 intensity correlates with discrimination. So you can imagine that when COVID-19 intensifies, that could actually lead to more discrimination because if there's more scarcity in appointment access, if, if you have more people applying for fewer of your appointments, you can be more picky about it. And so there's other research that shows that, for example, discrimination can sometimes change during recessions. And in recessions, there's more discrimination uh, and employment, for example. So we wanted to see if that might be going on here with COVID-19, but, but, but we don't find but anything in our data so far. But wouldn't the, na the nature of the, uh, as you were saying, sort of the nature of these consultations being so different sort of post-COVID yeah. might, you know, increase your sort of willingness to engage with, 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 you know, with patients on, via, via an online yeah. kind of consulting. That's a really good first. point. Yeah. So I guess to, let me sort of reiterate that to make sure I'm understanding. I guess the idea would be that since you're moving to telehealth, you might be more likely to have more, like, so if there's sort of an aversion to a particular group, you maybe have less of a version if it's going to be on telehealth versus in person. Yeah. yeah because it's sort of less personal. Yeah. That's yeah. something that we've thought about, but we, I don't know. I'm going to make a note that we want to make sure we kind of talk more about this in the paper. So less aversion in person. Is sort well, of I suggest that you, yeah. there's some way of controlling. Well, I guess you can do before and after um, because the, the, the need and the rise in demand for telehealth services and mental health services went way up. So you've got yeah. to be able to distinguish um, whether it, it was the large number and it was the time versus it was just telehealth or something else. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to just, we're going to try to break that apart if we can, but we kind of get a general equilibrium effect where we're seeing like, you know, how appointment offers change and that could be driven by changes in supply or demand. So it's hard to disentangle that, but we are gonna try to look at the telehealth element. So we have information on if the profile mentions telehealth, 
Um, and then we also know if when they respond to us, if they mention telehealth appointment or not, like this is going to be on Zoom or I can do in person. I'm not sure. If you don't um, have the data to distinguish uh, yourself, one of the things you could do is the appropriate background research to figure that out. Go to a place like Fair Health that's got claims. And if you've got an NSF grant, buy the data to allow you to determine um, the demand for mental health services before and after what type. And I, since they only have claims data, I think the problem is that you won't be able to um, figure out um, people's gender, race, and ethnicity, but anything you can do. Otherwise, I think people are gonna say, Otherwise, I think people are going to say, but the demand went way up and you can't figure out what this response is due to. Right. I, I, I Debbie, I totally agree. That's that's a really good point. So, yeah, we can't we, we really want to be able to figure out how much of this decrease in access is through increased demand, holding supply constant right. versus that right. and or reduction in supply where therapists are less likely to offer appointments. So there's some data collection I wish we could have done at the time to get at that, but I like your idea of looking at claims data to try to actually get a better sort of estimate of how demand is changing. So that's something I'm gonna look at. So I made a note on that. So I appreciate your, your comments there as someone who's actually more of a health person than I am. This is like my first health paper. So I'm just like pretending. Oh, okay. So I, well, this is all, this is all a farce. contact me for <laughs> help. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to toss this to Ben because Ben is actually my actual health economist. So he knows more about this kind of stuff. But that's, that's, that's a really good idea. So I made a note of that. So I'm looking forward to looking up on that. Uh, really, really quickly. I know I've got like two minutes left. Um, so we have some data on, we use different measures. So we have daily case and death data from the New York Times. We also have another measure of COVID intensity, which is going to be excess weekly deaths. There's a lot of literature on that I'm not going to get into, but we tried different methods of, sort of quantifying intensity of COVID. The idea is we're going to look at how COVID intensity varies across states. And so the idea is our main specification is going to be having safe X effects, or the idea is going to be as COVID becomes more intense in your state, how does that associate with appointment access? So we're going to have a linear probability model, which we run probits and the same results, basically. Um, we're gonna estimate this once using um, the, both of the measures of daily intensity, so daily case, daily deaths, and another time we're gonna run it with weekly excess deaths. So we'll show you the different versions of that particular COVID intensity control. But generally speaking, we're gonna basically add a COVID intensity control to the regression. Then we'll show you what this regression looks like when we add in um, state and time fixed effects. So once we add in our preferred specification, we add in state, uh, state fixed effects, what we're gonna be looking at is as COVID intensifies in the state, how does that associate with appointment access? I understand, but I cannot guarantee that I will read it in time. And that is the problem. Okay. Well, I, let me know if I can clarify. I know I'm running out of time on this one, so I apologize. And then we also looked at for intersectionality, but I'm gonna skip that. Um, so these are sort of the main results here. Um, so what we're gonna see here is that we measure COVID intensity two different ways. Um, and so when we, when we look at the regression here, regression three, we add in um, state and timing fixed effects, like weak fixed effects. So we're controlling for you know, how COVID's varying by week nationally, and we're looking at controlling for state averages. And we find that a one standard deviation increase in um, daily COVID-19 cases associated with a, a 7.5 percentage point reduction in uh, the probability that you get an appointment offer. Uh, we see the results are a little bit stronger if we use this excess deaths measure. And there's some literature that sort of talks about how excess deaths is sort of a better measure, measure of burden because COVID-19 mm -hmm. can lead to cases and deaths, but then also can put strain on other aspects of the health system that can cause mortality, unfortunately. So that's another measure. And so we see somewhat stronger results using that particular measure. But that measure, we do see that as um, uh, weekly excess deaths increases in the state, uh, we see that that's associated with reductions in appointment access. So one standard deviation increase in excess deaths from COVID-19 is associated with a, a 5% uh, percentage point lower um, positive response rate or appointment offer uh, response rate. Okay, so apologies, that was pretty quick. Uh, really quickly, there's a lot we have to do more on this. We're interested in any feedback. We're gonna look at, trying to look at the effect of shelter in place ordinances. I know Joe and others have looked at sort of COVID policies and how they correlate with outcomes. We're gonna look at that. 
Uh, we have to put in some data on MHP characteristics. There's a lot we need to do on telehealth because we want to look at the data around that. Uh, and I appreciate Debbie's suggestions, other people's suggestions. There's a lot to do here. So we'll end with that. Um, super appreciate any kind of comments, questions. That's very helpful as we can make adjustments before we put into this, this into the field again. And I am sort of a newbie to health research. So um, there's things that definitely missed. So I appreciate any kind of comments there. Um, I have time if anyone wants to hang here and like ask me questions or if I can help with anything. Uh, I really, you know, really appreciate that. But, you know, obviously you've been here for a long time and I appreciate your attention. So, um, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to stay around, but I am available if anyone wants to, you know, quote unquote, come up to the presenter after the talk sort of a thing. And so thank you so much for, you know, being supportive and being, uh, allowing me to present virtually. I really appreciate the accommodations and uh, thanks so much for all of your helpful questions and comments. Thanks so much, Pat. Really appreciate it. Are there any sort of final uh, questions from the audience before we... All right, then everyone have a, a very happy Thanksgiving next week. Uh, we'll return for our final seminar the week after Thanksgiving where uh, Bree Lang will be joining us from the University of California, uh, Riverside to uh, present a paper in uh, the youngest of education. So I look forward to seeing you at our, at our final talk. Enjoy your, 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 your turkey. <laughs>